Objective First, Fourth Edition, by Annette Capel and Wendy Sharp, published by Cambridge University Press and Uckles, 2014. This recording is copyright. CD Two. Track Two, Unit Thirteen, Thirteen Point One, Exercise Four. With me now are Sandra Wilson and Mike Tripp. Mike is owner of a successful new travel company, Just Trips, and Sandra works for him as publicity manager. They were actually in the same class at school, though at that time they did not get on with each other. They met again by chance last year, when Sandra went for an interview at Just Trips and was surprised to find Mike across the table. Sandra, when you were at school, did you think Mike would become successful like this? To be honest, no one thought Mike would get anywhere. He was the original underachiever. That's why we didn't get on. My group of friends were quite hardworking. You know, we did all the homework, made an effort in class. But Mike was the complete opposite. He was bad news, actually. Is this true, Mike? I'm afraid so. I wasn't the only one, though. It was uncool for boys to work. A whole group of us were like that. I don't remember being especially horrible to Sandra. Talk about a selective memory. Why? Well, he would regularly do annoying things like stealing my ruler or hiding my books. You saw it as a big joke, I suppose, Mike. Never thought about it. I can see now that I might have been a bit, a bit of a nuisance. I've forgiven you, though. And you've done very well since, Mike. Yeah, I got on with my life. Um. I don't really regret my behaviour back then. Obviously, I shouldn't have made trouble for you, Sandra. But for myself, it didn't matter. I've done okay in spite of school. You have, Mike. But there are lots of others in your gang who didn't make it. Hmm. I can think of one or two. But I still think if you know what you want out of life, you'll get there. I mean, look at me. I didn't pass many exams. I even walked out of some, like science. Wrote my name at the top of the paper and thought. I can't do this. Ah,、uh, what the heck? The sun's shining. I'm off. Incredible! I was totally stressed out during exams. Spent hours revising, and Mike managed to fail virtually everything and still be successful. Should you have been more relaxed at school, Sandra? That's easy to say now. I had a lot of pressure on me to do well. My parents, my brothers, all my family expected the best. Same here. But my dad sort of looked beyond school. He knew I'd be okay. He'd left school himself at fourteen, and he always felt that I'd sort things out for myself somehow. And how did you get the company started? No careers advice from school, I imagine. Careers teachers—they didn't have a clue. I got things started in a small way while I was still at school. Actually, I used to help out in a local travel agency, buying and selling cheap tickets on the phone. In my final year, I sometimes spent my lunch times checking the internet on the school computer. I found some good deals for flights that I managed to sell on. Then, when I left school, my dad gave me a bit of money and I set up an office, and it all like took off. So school did help you a little, or its facilities did. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to leave it there. One final thing, Mike. Why did Sandra get the job? Oh.、Uh... University education, languages, a good communicator. She's great. Just what the company needed. All thanks to school, Mike. Track three, thirteen point two, exercise five, speaker one. I'm a retired head teacher, and I want to make two points. First, I know from my own experience that teachers tend to be female, and I believe we need to get more men into all our schools. Boys need men around as role models from an early age. My second point is linked to this. There's a growing problem of broken marriages and one-parent families, which affects all children, but especially boys, because they usually end up living with their mothers and having less contact with their fathers. Men are so important to boys' development. Track four, thirteen point two, exercise six, speaker two. Well, I'm an infant teacher, and I work with children from the age of four. Both boys and girls arrive at school interested and excited on day one. 
But I find during that first year that I can't get the parents of boys to help their children at home. They expect their boys to be out playing football after school, not sitting at home reading a book. Basic skills have to be introduced in the home. And because the girls' parents do this, the girls race ahead. Then the boys feel they're failing, so they start mucking about, and things go from bad to worse. Speaker 3 Can I widen the topic beyond schools? Society has changed radically in the last 20 years, and fathers are no longer the breadwinners, necessarily. Indeed, the average boy growing up now may see a lot of men who are unemployed. And, of course, he's going to look at that and say, what's the point? There's no future for me. Girls, on the other hand, now see lots of opportunities, and they want to get out there and compete, get to the top. We haven't faced up to this, and yet it was obviously going to happen. Speaker 4 Picking up on what the infant teacher said, I've always understood the brain develops differently in boys and girls. So girls aged four develop quickly, whereas boys take longer to get going. For boys especially, I think we formalise education too soon in Britain. I can find no other examples in the world where formal teaching starts so early. I believe we should extend nursery education to the age of six, so that there is more time for play, for discovery, and above all, language. Then, by the age of six, boys would be ready for formal learning. Speaker 5 I think we should give credit to what has happened. I mean, it's a success story for girls, isn't it? OK, so girls are now achieving better results at school than boys, which is great. It was not the case 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. For the last three years, more girls have gained university places than boys. Good for them. I think this is all part of the wider picture of equal opportunities, and we should view it positively. Track 5. Exam Folder 7. Paper 3. Part 3. Exercise 1. You will hear the first speaker talking about his experience of education. Look at the statements A to H and decide which one is true for the first speaker. Speaker 1 When I started my last year at school, I didn't take it seriously enough. I should have chosen subjects which were useful rather than ones I liked or that sounded easy. By the time the exams came, I'd given up and I did very badly. I knew I'd have to work hard, but I wasn't able to catch up with my friends. Because I failed at science, I can't be a teacher, which is what I really want to do. I'm doing a part-time job in order to make ends meet, and next year I'll be starting evening classes to get better qualifications. Track 6, Exam Folder 7, Paper 3, Part 3, Exercise 2, Speaker 2. I left school and moved to a college to take my final exams. It was the best decision I could have made. At the college, nobody seemed to care about homework and this really motivated me. I had to plan my work myself. There was no one to make you do it and no one to check up on what you'd done. I was still dependent on my parents for money, but that was OK. I learned a lot about real life there. Things like getting on with people and organising your time, which has been really useful now I'm working. Speaker 3 When I left school, I didn't have a particular career in mind, so I decided to do environmental studies at university, mainly because I'd enjoyed geography at school. I didn't really like the course at university, and I did think about leaving, but instead I changed courses, which was easier than I expected. I think university was useful in that I learnt how to live alone and how to budget, and as I'm an underpaid teacher now, that really helps. Speaker 4 I had no difficulty choosing what I was going to do. My parents are both doctors, and ever since I was small, I also wanted to do that. They really encouraged me, and I did well at school, and got into a good medical school fairly easily. It was surprisingly tough at medical school, but I had some good friends and we pulled through together. 
I think the doubts only began to set in when I graduated and got my first job in a hospital. I began to wonder if I'd missed out because I'd been so focused on becoming a doctor. So now I'm doing some voluntary work in Africa, which I'm really enjoying. Speaker 5 I decided to take a year off after doing my last year at school. I'd had enough of revising and sitting in a library, so I decided to go off to Australia for nine months and earn a bit of money. I've got relatives there who put me up when I first arrived and found me a job. It wasn't doing anything particularly interesting, but the great part was that I was getting to know people who were completely different to the ones I'd known back home. I really recommend taking a year out, but you need to have a firm plan or it could end up a waste of time. Now you will hear part three again. Speaker one. When I started my last year at school, I didn't take it seriously enough. I should have chosen subjects which were useful rather than ones I liked or that sounded easy. By the time the exams came, I'd given up and I did very badly. I knew I'd have to work hard, but I wasn't able to catch up with my friends. Because I failed at science, I can't be a teacher which is what I really want to do. I'm doing a part-time job in order to make ends meet, and next year I'll be starting evening classes to get better qualifications. Speaker 2 I left school and moved to a college to take my final exams. It was the best decision I could have made. At the college, nobody seemed to care about homework, and this really motivated me. I had to plan my work myself. There was no one to make you do it, and no one to check up on what you'd done. I was still dependent on my parents for money, but that was OK. I learned a lot about real life there. Things like getting on with people and organising your time, which has been really useful now I'm working. Speaker 3 When I left school, I didn't have a particular career in mind, so I decided to do environmental studies at university, mainly because I'd enjoyed geography at school. I didn't really like the course at university, and I did think about leaving, but instead I changed courses, which was easier than I expected. I think university was useful in that I learnt how to live alone and how to budget, and as I'm an underpaid teacher now, that really helps. Speaker 4 I had no difficulty choosing what I was going to do. My parents are both doctors and ever since I was small I also wanted to do that. They really encouraged me and I did well at school and got into a good medical school fairly easily. It was surprisingly tough at medical school, but I had some good friends and we pulled through together. I think the doubts only began to set in when I graduated and got my first job in a hospital. I began to wonder if I'd missed out because I'd been so focused on becoming a doctor. So now I'm doing some voluntary work in Africa, which I'm really enjoying. Speaker 5 I decided to take a year off after doing my last year at school. I'd had enough of revising and sitting in a library, so I decided to go off to Australia for nine months and earn a bit of money. I've got relatives there who put me up when I first arrived and found me a job. It wasn't doing anything particularly interesting, but the great part was that I was getting to know people who were completely different to the ones I'd known back home. I really recommend taking a year out, but you need to have a firm plan or it could end up a waste of time. Track 7, Unit 14, 14.2, Exercise 4, Speaker 1. There's a big music festival in my town every summer. For the last three years, I've worked in the festival office, doing a whole range of things, from putting leaflets in envelopes to arranging hotel bookings for the various performers. I know I'm flexible, I've had to be, and I've definitely got commitment. I don't mind working long hours as long as there's an end in sight. I really enjoy big events too. The more people there are, the more enjoyable it is. Speaker 2 I've always been interested in languages. My mother's from Quebec in Canada, so we speak both German and French at home. I've been learning English since I was 12. By next summer, I'll have been learning it for over 10 years, so I'm sure I'll be really fluent. 
I like dealing with people face to face, and people say I've got quite a lot of talent for communication. I can think really fast, which gives me a lot of confidence. Oh, and I'm a very positive person too. Speaker three. I've been working in the Gap since I left college last year. I think I dress well myself. That's important when you're in this sort of job. I know a lot about sports and leisure clothing, and I often get asked for advice when people are choosing what to buy. Once you've worked in a busy clothing store, you can handle anything. I don't mind pressure. In fact, it's usually a good thing. Makes the day go more quickly. Speaker four. I'm having a year off between school and medical school. At the moment, I'm doing part-time voluntary work in a hospital. I've also been going to evening classes to get a first aid qualification, which I've just managed to get. I've got lots of energy, and I like to think I'm extremely fit. My boyfriend thinks I'm obsessed with sport. Actually, I swim for a club and I play tennis or basketball whenever I get the chance. I'd like to specialise in sports medicine when I'm older. Speaker five. I did a one-year course in catering after leaving school, and since then I've been working alongside one of Edinburgh's top chefs. She's taught me so much, not just recipes and techniques either. The most important thing I've learned is how to cope with working at speed. It can get very busy some evenings, but through her, I've developed ways of being better organised,、uh, staying in control when it gets really hot in the kitchen. Track eight, unit fifteen, fifteen point one, exercise two. Situated in the northwestern part of Arizona, the Grand Canyon is one of the natural wonders of the world. Contrary to popular belief, the Grand Canyon is not the longest, deepest, or widest canyon in the world. But it is accessible, and with little vegetation to hide it, it feels big. Nothing prepares you for that first sight of it. From the top, it drops 1.6 kilometers to the desert floor below. But however vast it seems, it is not big enough to support the millions of people who visit it every year. When one section of the Grand Canyon was declared a national park in 1919, three years after the creation of the National Park Service, visitor numbers were 44,000. Today, with five million visitors a year, the Park Service is finding it difficult to keep the canyon accessible to the public and to safeguard it for future generations. The pressures on the Grand Canyon National Park forced the Park Service to draw up a management plan. One of the first problems it tackled was that of the large number of visitors' cars, which needed parking space. The Park Service got around the problem by allowing visitors to take advantage of free buses, which take them on a number of routes around the park. Some of the other problems faced by the park are the result of things happening outside its boundaries. Take air pollution. On summer days, when there are southwesterly winds, the pollution blown in from Southern California can restrict the views over the canyon. Then another of the big problems is the availability of water resources in the park, as at present there is a drought. The park cannot draw water from the river, but only from a spring on the north side of the canyon using a pipeline. If this pipeline is damaged, then water has to be brought in by truck. This last happened in 1995 when floods caused a landslide, which destroyed the pipeline. The Colorado River, which created the canyon, looks wild, but in fact is managed intensely. 24 kilometers upstream is the Glen Canyon Dam, which has had a profound impact on the river. Now the river flow is about a tenth of what it was previously. The Colorado used to reach temperatures of 24 degrees in summer. Today it is a cold seven degrees all year, as water release comes from deep within the reservoir. In addition, the rapids are getting bigger as the river is too weak to move the boulders washed out of the canyons downstream. As a result of both these problems, some species of fish have become extinct. Visitors are proving to be powerful allies of the park. Those who once thought that the Grand Canyon was just an awesome hole in the ground soon learn that, however big it is, 
its popularity is in danger of destroying the very qualities that made it one of the seven natural wonders in the world. Track nine, unit fifteen, fifteen point one, exercise seven, measurement. Thirteen kilometers, thirty centimeters, not point five kilometers. Two point five meters, a hundred and fifty-three kilos, one meter fifty-three centimeters, a half, a quarter, two thirds. Dates: the first of May, eighteen ninety-nine; the third of August, two thousand; the twelfth of February, two thousand and four. The sixth of September, twenty sixteen. The twenty fifth of December, nineteen ninety. The fifteenth century. The fourth of the fifth, eleven. Money. Ten p, or ten pence. One pound forty five. Fifty dollars. Twenty euros thirty cents. Not. O one two three two three double six double seven eight. Three nil. Forty love. Zero or not degrees Celsius. Telephone numbers. O one two five six three double one. Three double nine. O O four four, three two four, double six seven O one two. Maths. Two plus six equals eight. Three minus two equals one. Four times four equals sixteen. Ten divided by two equals five. Twenty percent. Three degrees. The square root of sixteen. Track ten, exam folder eight, paper three, part four, exercise one. You will hear a radio interview with a girl called Lisa Green, who is talking about her stay at an eco lodge. An environmentally friendly hotel in Costa Rica, Central America. For questions one to seven, choose the best answer: A, B, or C. Look at question one. I'd like to welcome Lisa Green to the studio today. Lisa, you won a competition in a magazine to stay at an eco lodge, an environmentally friendly hotel in Costa Rica, didn't you? That's right. I had to write an article about recycling and why it is a good thing for the planet. You hadn't travelled outside of Europe before. How did you feel about the journey? Well, I flew to Costa Rica from London, and then had to take a small plane to an airport very near the eco lodge. I was then picked up at the local airport by the eco lodge manager in an electric car. It all took a bit longer than I was expecting. But then I was only used to short journeys within Europe. Anyway, I was so excited. I didn't care about having to change planes or travelling by myself for the first time. Track eleven, exam folder eight, paper three, part four, exercise three. I'm told the sight of the eco lodge is amazing. You must have seen quite a few animals and birds. Yes. It's high up on a mountain side, with incredible views of the surrounding forest and the sea. It has an observation gallery where you can sit and look over the rainforest. I particularly liked it when the parrots, which were amazingly gentle and unafraid, came and sat by me, hoping for a piece of fruit. There were also monkeys in the forest, but they were too shy to come up close. People are often disappointed that I didn't see any large animals like jaguars. But these are actually quite rare now. What was your accommodation like? There were sixteen small, really nice bungalows built around the central building. 
as it's environmentally friendly, there's no air conditioning, but the bungalows each have a roof which shades the outside of the building. Another good idea, especially for me, is that if you leave a light on accidentally, it will automatically switch itself off after 20 minutes. I also really liked the outdoor shower, but was really puzzled at first when I got back all hot and sweaty to find there was only cold water to wash in. This was because all the water is heated by solar power, and when the hot water is finished, you just have to wait for the sun to heat up some more. So what did you do while you were there? Did you go for walks through the forest? Yes. You can hike through the forest with one of the local guides, or you can choose from 13 different well-marked trails and go by yourself. Each one takes all day, and you do need to be in good shape, as the paths aren't always very easy. It's really worth it, though, just to hear the noise the birds make and to catch glimpses of them flying through the trees. What about swimming? Did you manage to do that? I went to the beach a few times, as it's only a 30-minute walk away. It's a beautiful sandy beach, and the sea and beach are absolutely clean, no litter or anything to ruin it. Another day, I went swimming in a natural pool under a waterfall. It was a real highlight of my trip. The water was really cold and refreshing. As you can imagine, I didn't miss the fact that there wasn't a swimming pool at the place I was staying. Now, one reason for your trip was to see the Conservation Centre in action, wasn't it? Yes. The centre supplies the Eco Lodge with organic food, but this is just a minor part of what they do. What the centre was built for is to develop green construction techniques using local materials and teach young people in the area how to use them. The people there were really friendly and I learnt a lot about their area. It's not really set up for tourists, so I was very lucky to be invited to visit. It must have been sad to leave. Are you going to write up your experience for the magazine? Yes. I have to send the magazine another article, this time on my trip. It needs to be at the magazine by the end of November, so it can be in the January edition. I know it'll be online from February if you want to read it and can't afford to buy a copy. Thank you, Lisa. And next week, I'm going to be talking to... Now you will hear part four again. I'd like to welcome Lisa Green to the studio today. Lisa, you won a competition in a magazine to stay at an eco-lodge, an environmentally friendly hotel, in Costa Rica, didn't you? That's right. I had to write an article about recycling and why it is a good thing for the planet. You hadn't travelled outside of Europe before. How did you feel about the journey? Well, I flew to Costa Rica from London and then had to take a small plane to an airport very near the eco-lodge. I was then picked up at the local airport by the eco-lodge manager in an electric car. It all took a bit longer than I was expecting, but then I was only used to short journeys within Europe. Anyway, I was so excited, I didn't care about having to change planes or travelling by myself for the first time. I'm told the sight of the eco-lodge is amazing. You must have seen quite a few animals and birds. Yes, it's high up on a mountainside with incredible views of the surrounding forest and the sea. It has an observation gallery where you can sit and look over the rainforest. I particularly liked it when the parrots, which were amazingly gentle and unafraid, came and sat by me, hoping for a piece of fruit. There were also monkeys in the forest, but they were too shy to come up close. People are often disappointed that I didn't see any large animals like jaguars, but these are actually quite rare now. What was your accommodation like? There were 16 small, really nice bungalows built around the central building. As it's environmentally friendly, there's no air conditioning, but the bungalows each have a roof which shades the outside of the building. Another good idea, especially for me, is that if you leave a light on accidentally, it will automatically switch itself off after 20 minutes. I also really liked the outdoor shower, but was really puzzled at first when I got back all hot and sweaty to find there was only cold water to wash in. This was because all the water is heated by solar power, 
And when the hot water is finished, you just have to wait for the sun to heat up some more. So, what did you do while you were there? Did you go for walks through the forest? Yes, you can hike through the forest with one of the local guides, or you can choose from thirteen different well-marked trails and go by yourself. Each one takes all day, and you do need to be in good shape, as the paths aren't always very easy. It's really worth it, though. Just to hear the noise the birds make and to catch glimpses of them flying through the trees. What about swimming? Did you manage to do that? I went to the beach a few times, as it's only a thirty-minute walk away. It's a beautiful sandy beach, and the sea and beach are absolutely clean, no litter or anything to ruin it. Another day, I went swimming in a natural pool under a waterfall. It was a real highlight of my trip. The water was really cold and refreshing, as you can imagine. I didn't miss the fact that there wasn't a swimming pool at the place I was staying. Now, one reason for your trip was to see the conservation centre in action, wasn't it? Yes, the centre supplies the eco lodge with organic food, but this is just a minor part of what they do. What the centre was built for is to develop green construction techniques using local materials. And teach young people in the area how to use them. The people there were really friendly, and I learnt a lot about their area. It's not really set up for tourists, so I was very lucky to be invited to visit. It must have been sad to leave. Are you going to write up your experience for the magazine? Yes, I have to send the magazine another article this time on my trip. It needs to be at the magazine by the end of November, so it can be in the January edition. I know it'll be online from February. If you want to read it and can't afford to buy a copy, thank you, Lisa. And next week, I'm going to be talking to. Track twelve, unit sixteen, sixteen point one, exercise three, one. My name is Akiko, and I was born in Hiroshima in Japan. I moved to England with my family when I was three. But my mother always makes us traditional Japanese food. For breakfast, we have soup, rice, and fish. For lunch, I eat noodles. But I also love hamburgers. It's very common for Japanese people to mix traditional and Western food. I'm conscious of healthy eating, and I eat a lot of vegetables. But I don't worry about my weight. In the evening, I'll have pasta or some more soup. Two. My name is Kunu, and I grew up in Alaska, where meals are central to Inuit life. I moved to Seattle when I was seventeen, and became physically ill because my body rejected Western foods. I do eat some Western food, though. For breakfast, I always have a cheese sandwich with orange juice. Lunch is usually raw fish, and for supper, I have reindeer or fish. I hardly eat any sweet foods, and I exercise five times a week. Three. Everyone calls me Gail. I exercise for about half an hour before breakfast, which is usually an omelet.、Uh, for lunch, I'll have a sandwich, a mixture of tuna and tomato paste on non-fat bread. I eat a lot, but I never eat fat. If I go out to eat, I always ask the waiter to miss out the cream or cheese or oil. People are used to it in LA. I keep a journal every day to say what exercise I've done and exactly what I've eaten. In the evening, I'll have grilled fish or chicken. Track thirteen, unit seventeen, seventeen point one. Exercise four. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer A, B, or C. Question one: You hear a woman talking about making jewelry. Two thousand and three was the year my passion for jewelry making began. There was a fantastic art teacher at school who made earrings and bracelets out of copper, and I thought, I want to do that one day too. 
I found an evening class where I learned a lot of useful techniques for working with gold and silver. I've never considered using the former for my own jewellery because it's outside my price range, but I can afford the latter, and in fact I've made several things with it recently. 2003 was the year my passion for jewellery making began. There was a fantastic art teacher at school who made earrings and bracelets out of copper and I thought, I want to do that one day too. I found an evening class where I learned a lot of useful techniques for working with gold and silver. I've never considered using the former for my own jewellery because it's outside my price range, but I can afford the latter and in fact I've made several things with it recently. Question 2 you hear two friends talking about postcards. Here are those cards I bought for you in Oxford to add to your collection. I hope you don't think they're too tatty. They must be at least 50 years old. Thanks. The condition they're in doesn't bother me. And actually, looking at the stamps, they're older than you say, which is brilliant because I haven't got many from the 1930s. Oh, so you're looking for cards from a certain period? Well, I collect all sorts, but I'm on the lookout for older ones that have text on the picture. I like this one, which says, Thinking of you in St Ives. Here are those cards I bought for you in Oxford to add to your collection. I hope you don't think they're too tatty. They must be at least 50 years old. Thanks. The condition they're in doesn't bother me. And actually, looking at the stamps, they're older than you say, which is brilliant because I haven't got many from the 1930s. Oh, so you're looking for cards from a certain period? Well, I collect all sorts, but I'm on the lookout for older ones that have text on the picture. I like this one, which says, Thinking of you in St Ives. Question 3. You hear a radio talk about wooden objects. I knew someone once who had an absolute passion for making things out of wood. He spent hours and hours on his hobby. Whatever the object was, he always took great pride in doing it well and making it unique by choosing a special wood. He never chose the same kind twice. He would make all sorts of things, a new handle for a fork with a pattern cut into it, enough models to fill several glass cases... He even made an electric guitar which he painted designs on, something he didn't normally do. One piece I remember well is a polar bear. The way it was carved really captured the look of the animal, walking heavily through the snow. I knew someone once who had an absolute passion for making things out of wood. He spent hours and hours on his hobby... Whatever the object was, he always took great pride in doing it well and making it unique by choosing a special wood. He never chose the same kind twice. He would make all sorts of things, a new handle for a fork with a pattern cut into it, enough models to fill several glass cases. He even made an electric guitar which he painted designs on, something he didn't normally do. One piece I remember well is a polar bear. The way it was carved really captured the look of the animal, walking heavily through the snow. Question 4. You hear a man talking about his hobby. People think it's a bit odd that I spend my weekends dressed up in anything from metal armour to old uniforms out in the open air. But it's good fun. The group that puts on these events was only formed about four months ago. I joined in April and we've already performed five battles. You learn a great deal about history because everything is researched properly, from the costumes to the actual battle tactics. My girlfriend's not too pleased with me at the moment. 
I'm going to have to miss her birthday because we're doing the Battle of Naseby. That's not the reason she's mad at me, though. She wanted to come too, but I wouldn't let her. People think it's a bit odd that I spend my weekends dressed up in anything from metal armour to old uniforms out in the open air. But it's good fun. The group that puts on these events was only formed about four months ago. I joined in April and we've already performed five battles. You learn a great deal about history because everything is researched properly. From the costumes to the actual battle tactics. My girlfriend's not too pleased with me at the moment. I'm going to have to miss her birthday because we're doing the Battle of Naseby. That's not the reason she's mad at me, though. She wanted to come too, but I wouldn't let her. Question 5. You hear a girl talking about collecting beads. This is Radio QB. The phone lines are open and we want to hear about your hobbies. And here's Eleanor from London. What are you into, Eleanor? Beads. I've got several hundred, in all shapes and sizes. Glass, metal, plastic ones. They're from all over the world, too. I've got a handful of beautiful wooden ones from India and some very unusual African ones carved out of bone. A few of them I've made up into earrings and necklaces, but what I really like doing is collecting especially coloured glass ones, which I've got loads of. And you say you've got several hundred. How long has it taken you to get so many? Not that long, really. I had lots of plastic ones when I was a kid, but I gave those away, so they don't count. I suppose I got serious about beads three years ago. Since then, my family have given me tins of beads as presents, and I spend most of my pocket money on them too. This is Radio QB. The phone lines are open and we want to hear about your hobbies. And here's Eleanor from London. What are you into, Eleanor? Beads. I've got several hundred, in all shapes and sizes. Glass, metal, plastic ones. They're from all over the world, too. I've got a handful of beautiful wooden ones from India and some very unusual African ones carved out of bone. A few of them I've made up into earrings and necklaces, but what I really like doing is collecting especially coloured glass ones, which I've got loads of. And you say you've got several hundred. How long has it taken you to get so many? Not that long, really. I had lots of plastic ones when I was a kid, but I gave those away, so they don't count. I suppose I got serious about beads three years ago. Since then, my family have given me tins of beads as presents, and I spend most of my pocket money on them too. Question 6. You hear part of a conversation in a radio play. Well, I've rung them twice already and they said I must take the matter up with you. It's clearly your responsibility as I got the model kit from you in the first place. It was sealed when I got it too. No, I'm quite sure. I buy a lot of your kits, you know. Do you want me to contact Model Makers magazine and tell them about what's happened? You have all my details, so I suggest you sort it out. Well, I've rung them twice already and they said I must take the matter up with you. It's clearly your responsibility as I got the model kit from you in the first place. It was sealed when I got it too. No, I'm quite sure. I buy a lot of your kits, you know. Do you want me to contact Model Makers magazine and tell them about what's happened? You have all my details, so I suggest you sort it out. Question 7. You hear an interview with a girl who collects pebbles. I'm with Jenny Braintree who paints the whole world in miniature on small stones she finds at the seaside. Jenny, you took up this hobby four years ago. Uh, Uh, It was four months ago, in fact. I was on a beach holiday with my parents and I collected loads of nice, smooth pebbles. 
When I got home, I started to paint tiny images of beautiful places like the Swiss mountains and the Brazilian rainforest. I've done 89 so far. Amazing. These pictures are no more than five centimetres across and yet they contain so much detail. So what's the reason behind this, Jenny? Do you earn anything from all your hard work? Dad thinks I could sell them, but I'm not interested in that. And anyway, they're too special to me. My real aim is to get better at painting, because that's what I want to do when I'm older. And although I haven't been to the places I illustrate on the pebbles, it can be really good fun finding out about them on the internet. I'm with Jenny Braintree, who paints the whole world in miniature on small stones she finds at the seaside. Jenny, you took up this hobby four years ago. Uh, and... It was four months ago, in fact. I was on a beach holiday with my parents and I collected loads of nice, smooth pebbles. When I got home, I started to paint tiny images of beautiful places like the Swiss mountains and the Brazilian rainforest. I've done 89 so far. Amazing. These pictures are no more than five centimetres across and yet they contain so much detail. So what's the reason behind this, Jenny? Do you earn anything from all your hard work? Dad thinks I could sell them, but I'm not interested in that. And anyway, they're too special to me. My real aim is to get better at painting, because that's what I want to do when I'm older. And although I haven't been to the places I illustrate on the pebbles, it can be really good fun finding out about them on the internet. Question 8. You hear an interview with a boy whose hobby is slot car racing. Jamie Eagle, who is the outright winner of today's slot car racing, is with me now. Congratulations, Jamie. And this is now your 10th win. So, where did it all begin? I know your father was also racing here today. Did he know what he was doing when he persuaded you to take up such a time-consuming hobby? Um, actually, it was me who persuaded him. He's only been racing this year. He's pretty hopeless at it, too. <laughs> no, it was my cousin who's to blame. He used to take me along when he went to race meetings. I was five at the time, and I thought it was just brilliant. And if your father's racing his own car, who do you have as backup today? I've introduced my friend Ian to slot car racing... At the moment, he's free to help me, though next year he hopes to have a car of his own. Jamie Eagle, who is the outright winner of today's slot car racing, is with me now. Congratulations, Jamie, and this is now your 10th win. So, where did it all begin? I know your father was also racing here today. Did he know what he was doing when he persuaded you to take up such a time-consuming hobby? Um, actually, it was me who persuaded him. He's only been racing this year. He's pretty hopeless at it, too. <laughs> no, it was my cousin who's to blame. He used to take me along when he went to race meetings. I was five at the time, and I thought it was just brilliant. And if your father's racing his own car, who do you have as backup today? I've introduced my friend Ian to slot car racing. At the moment, he's free to help me, though next year he hopes to have a car of his own. Track 14, Unit 18, 18.2, Exercise 2, Speaker 1. All of her books are really well researched and they're full of amazing details about what daily life used to be like. So you learn a lot about that period. It's extremely imaginative, the characters are very realistic and, as the title suggests, there's a murder mystery too. This is the seventh one of hers I've read, and I can't wait to get my hands on another. Speaker 2 I found the book fascinating, but at the same time it's more than a little depressing. We're so dependent on these creatures. The writers consider the planet's future, suggesting what might happen if they died out completely. It's a really scary possibility, actually, because their disappearance would affect the food chain dramatically. In only four years, apparently. Speaker 3 I don't normally read lengthy books of this kind, but I'd enjoyed several of his novels, 
so I was interested to find out more about the man himself. It's certainly comprehensive and thoroughly researched, but I have to admit I found it a little hard going in places. The writer's own account of his experiences is so much more colourful. Still, it's worth keeping on the shelves to revisit one day. Speaker 4 A friend lent me the first book written by this author, which I enjoyed, but this one is loads better. It's the same character from the previous story, but he's a lot more developed somehow. It's set a few centuries ahead of now, and the vision of how a society so different to ours might operate is really powerful. I got completely carried along with the storyline, and the dialogue is fantastic too. Yes, a great read. Speaker 5 Once I started it, I just couldn't put it down. The plot is quite complicated, and it moves along at a really fast pace. What I like best about it is the two main characters. They have such different personalities. The private investigator himself is quite jokey and upbeat, while his business partner is a rather mysterious figure. He's an ex-police officer who says very little, but is always there to provide backup when things get tough. This is the ninth title in the series, but I haven't read them all yet. Track 15, Unit 19, 19.2, Exercise 4 Good morning. On the programme this morning we have Dr Sylvia Carpenter, who is a family doctor. Dr Carpenter, you're a great believer in Chinese medicine, aren't you? Yes, I am. When I was a medical student, I spent a wonderful month at a hospital in Hong Kong where they use acupuncture as well as Western medicine, which is, of course, what I was studying. I saw how effective acupuncture could be, especially for people with digestive disorders, asthma, back pain or stress. Now, you're not qualified to practice acupuncture yourself, are you? Oh, I'm just an ordinary GP or general practitioner. I work in a small community with about 3,000 people on my list. In the past, we only referred patients to specialists at the local hospital for treatment, you know, to have their chests x-rayed or have a blood test done. Now, I often suggest they see an acupuncturist as well, if I feel it would be of benefit. I can't actually recommend one specifically, but I keep a list of qualified ones. So, say I go to see an acupuncturist about my backache. What would happen to me? Well, first of all, the acupuncturist will ask you for very detailed information, not just about your medical history, but about your lifestyle, what you eat, what sort of exercise you do, how much sleep you get... The treatment you need is then decided and he or she will insert needles in various parts of your body. If you have a back pain, you won't necessarily have a needle in your back, though. It might be in one of your limbs, maybe in a knee or a wrist. How often would I have to go? It depends on your problems. For some conditions, one or two treatments a week for several months may be recommended. For less acute problems, usually fewer visits are required. There aren't usually any side effects. You might feel worse for a couple of days, but that just means the treatment is working. It's quite common to feel exhausted after the first treatment, and this can be overcome with a bit of extra rest. Now, the big question, does it hurt? Well, it'd be wrong to say no. It depends where the needles are inserted. Some areas are more sensitive than others. Once the needles are in place, there's no pain at all. Are any positive benefits all in the mind, do you think? No, not at all. Acupuncture has been successfully used on cats and dogs. These animals don't understand or believe in the process that helps them to get better. A positive attitude towards the treatment may reinforce its effects, just as a negative attitude may hinder the effects. It's a relatively new type of treatment, isn't it? Only in the West... It was first discovered in China in 2696 BC. In 1671, a French Jesuit priest wrote about his experiences in China and was the first Westerner to see acupuncture in use. 
in 1820, acupuncture was actually being used in a Paris hospital. Acupuncture received a lot of publicity in the West when James Reston, a reporter for the New York Times, was covering the visit of President Nixon to China in 1971. Reston developed appendicitis, and his appendix was removed using acupuncture as the anaesthetic. He felt no pain during or after the operation because of acupuncture. But in some ways, your question was right. Acupuncture is still a fairly new subject in the West, but growing all the time. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. Now we are... Track 16, Unit 20, 20.2, Exercise 1. Good morning. Here is the news. Anthony Curcio, 28, of Monroe, Washington, was sentenced today to 72 months in prison for robbing an armored car in Monroe. Curcio, a former star athlete in high school who earned college scholarships in basketball and football, carefully planned the robbery over nearly a year. Curcio was arrested in a car park following a spending spree at a shopping mall. At the trial... Curcio stated that he had needed the money from the robbery to pay to take his friends on an all-expenses-paid vacation to Las Vegas. According to records filed in the case, Curcio first came up with the idea of robbing an armored car while working for his parents' landscaping company. They were doing some work near the Monroe branch of the Bank of America, and Curcio studied the deliveries that the armored car made every week. At the same time, he decided on the best ways to escape after the robbery. He manufactured a disguise with clothing that could be easily removed, and even strung a cable in a nearby river so that he could use an old tire as an inflatable raft and pull himself down the creek away from the scene of the crime. Curcio decided to use an open Wi-Fi network to put an advertisement on the Internet offering men a potential job. The open Wi-Fi was to enable him to post things on the Internet without the police being able to trace him. Applicants for the job were told that they had to stand outside the Bank of America in Monroe at a certain time on a certain date and wear specific clothing. This was to consist of a blue shirt, yellow vest, safety goggles, and work shoes. They were told that there was construction work available for whoever turned up. On the day of the robbery, Curcio wore a wig, safety goggles, work boots, and a tearaway blue shirt, and he pretended to be a landscaper cutting weeds outside the bank. When the armored car arrived, it stopped outside the bank to unload the money, and the delivery person got out. Curcio stopped working and then sprayed the delivery person in the face with pepper and stole a bag containing approximately $400,000. Curcio remembered to remove his wig, face mask, work clothes, and hat, and threw them in bushes before making his escape on the inflatable raft down the river. What initially confused police was the group of people at the scene, all dressed in the same clothing as the robber. However, the FBI and Monroe police were soon on Curcio's trail. According to police, three weeks before the robbery took place, a homeless man had seen Curcio trying out his ideas for the robbery. Curcio had arrived in a wig and gone through what he would do on the day of the robbery. Before leaving in his car, he had then dropped the wig and an empty bottle behind a trash can at the bank. The homeless man had reported Curcio's license plate number to police, and given them the items he had found behind the trash can. The police found out that the car was registered to Curcio's wife. Nothing was done at the time, as there was no crime to connect it to, but the police had kept the items. When news came of the attack on the armored van at the bank, a police sergeant remembered getting the earlier report. Investigators retrieved the drink bottle from storage and found it had a sample of DNA on it. They then compared it to the DNA from the face mask and wig left by Curcio a short distance from the scene of the real robbery. The DNA from the bottle matched the DNA from the items left at the scene. 
The police then began following Curcio and finally arrested him in the car park. Some $220,000 of the stolen money was recovered following Curcio's arrest. He pleaded guilty to all charges. In asking for a five-year sentence, Assistant United States Attorney Bruce Mayaki said that, and I quote, All robberies are inherently violent and serious. This robbery stands out for its boldness, level of planning, and its ingenuity. As has been seen, Curcio was obsessive in his planning. This, however, led to his ultimate downfall. Track 17, Unit 21, 21.1, Exercise 3, Part 1. My name is Julia Banks, and I'm here today to defend modern high-rise architecture. Those who criticise this type of living accommodation claim that it's unnatural. The argument goes something like this. If we were meant to live up in the sky, we would have been born with wings. Well, as an experienced architect, I obviously challenge this view. The fact is that many people have to opt for high-rise accommodation, and our profession has a responsibility to design homes that are fit for them to live in. Track 18, 21.1, Exercise 4, Part 2 There's no doubt that things have improved over time. We look back to the high-rise buildings of the 1960s where people were sometimes uprooted from established communities and forced to live in ugly concrete blocks against their will. Yet we should remember that this was a time when many people wanted to be rehoused because their living conditions were so bad. And this was a policy upheld by government rather than decided by architects. So the situation has changed for the better. It seems that lack of consultation over new buildings is rarely an issue with the public nowadays. The fact of the matter is that there are much tougher planning regulations in place than was previously the case. I should underline my personal experience here. For six years of my childhood, I was in a tower block in quite a run-down part of Bristol, so I do know what it's like. That's largely what drove me to become an architect, actually. Yes, some 60s architecture is poor, but the point is, if it hadn't happened, we would be making similar mistakes today, whereas as it is, we have been able to learn from it and move on. For one thing, the buildings being put up today generally have better materials than in the past, certainly in comparison with the 1960s. A lot more thought goes into this aspect, with the upside that new buildings look more attractive as a result. Then there are the environmental considerations. We have to design buildings that are efficient. So for us in Britain, that means paying particular attention to things like heating. Of course, that particular requirement wouldn't be an issue for architects in southern Europe. Something that does trouble me is urban sprawl, by which I mean the endless suburbs. And their existence is at a huge cost to the taxpaying public in terms of upkeep. Basic services like drainage, road maintenance, that sort of thing. City expansion isn't very good news for the countryside either. At the same time, there's sometimes appalling decay in the middle of our cities as a direct result of this move outwards. Shops in the centre have closed because of out-of-town facilities and people are forced to drive when once they bought locally. That's not sustainable, is it? What I believe in and what many architects are trying to work towards is the regeneration of our city centres – but this can only happen if we think vertically. Design skyscrapers, in other words. There's no space to do anything else. It's a really exciting development that could breathe new life into our cities. Imagine if your building was a multi-use one, where you just go downstairs to a jazz club or across the street to pick up some late-night shopping. This is the upmarket housing of the future, where no one will need to own a car. In a recent radio phone-in, 67% of callers thought that the car should be banned altogether from central London. I truly think people are ready for this. They understand that traffic is slowly killing us. Living in the city has to become a healthier and more acceptable option. Track 19, Unit 22, 
22.1. Exercise 2. Carmen, here are your two photographs. They show a lot of people in one place. Please let Jurgen have a look at them. Carmen, I'd like you to compare these photographs and say how you would feel in each situation. Remember, you have only about a minute for this, so don't worry if I interrupt you, all right? Yes, fine. Well, the pictures have two things in common. The first, which you mentioned, is the huge number of people. The other is that they both show music taking place. This one is at a major rock festival. It's outdoors, of course. The other one is indoors, and it looks like an enormous orchestra. There must be hundreds of performers there. I mean, uh, there are over a hundred cellists taking part. I don't know where it is, but all the musicians are quite young, so maybe it's a concert organized by several schools. Um, the main difference between the two scenes is that in the first one, there is an audience. People are watching a band on stage, while in this one, everyone is a performer. I really like being part of a large audience, sitting back and relaxing to the music. Thank you, Carmen. Now, Jürgen, which situation would you prefer to be in? Oh, the orchestra, definitely. I'd rather participate than watch music. I actually belong to a large choir, and we sing as a group of about 120. It's really good fun, and because there are so many of us, it doesn't matter if you make a mistake sometimes. Thank you. Track 20, Unit 23. 23.1. Exercise 3. Thank you for asking me here today to talk about what happened to me and my brother Dave when we went on a camping trip. On the morning of May 18, 1980, we were camping about 18 kilometers from Mount St. Helens in Washington State in the United States. I was making coffee over a wood fire and Dave was fishing down in the creek. I saw him look up at a small black shape on the horizon. He shouted that there must be a forest fire. It couldn't be a storm as we knew that rain wasn't forecast. Within 30 seconds, the thing was absolutely enormous. And then it just kept getting bigger and bigger and coming at us faster and faster. And it became very dark. All I could think was that I wished I were somewhere else. It wasn't like a smoke cloud. It was as if it were alive, and it was massive and dense and very black. It was the strangest thing you can imagine. It was totally silent until it got down into the canyon where we were, and then there was a huge roaring. I remember looking at the fire, and the wind just blew the flames low along the ground and watching the handle of my coffee pot just kind of melt in the flames. And then this awful cold. It just surrounded us. The funny thing was that the spoon inside the pot was just fine. I wasn't just frightened by then. I was absolutely petrified. And so was Dave. Well, we started to run back towards the tent. Stupidly, I thought that if only we could get in the tent, we'd be safe. Then the thing hit us. It was, it was like a bomb going off, and I fell over backwards and was covered with dirt. I remember wishing it would stop, and almost immediately it did. And then Dave reached over to me and asked me if I was okay. We got up and realized that there were trees all around us. In fact, we'd fallen down into a hole left by the roots of a tree, and then some branches had covered us. Dave tried to climb out of the hole, but it was too hot. Then, when we did get out, we were met with such a scene of total destruction. Everything had happened so fast. When we set off, it was difficult to breathe, so we took our shirts off and wrapped them around our heads. There were flashes of lightning across the sky at that point, too. Wet towels would have been better, but needs must, as they say. It was really hard to get out of the valley because the ash was nearly a meter deep and it was so hot underneath you could only stay in it for a short period of time. 
Then we had to get up on a tree stump and take our shoes off and unroll our pants. But within a few minutes, they would be filled up again. There was a terrible smell like rotten eggs, not smoke or burning wood. Anyway, we were really lucky. We could easily have been killed. I wish now that we'd taken a radio with us. Then maybe we would have had some warning. Even a couple of hours' warning would have helped. I had my cell phone with me, but there was no signal in that valley. We went back a few days later and found the site where our tent had been. Thank goodness we fell in that hole.